Good morning. Thank you for joining us via live stream for our service. Uh, before we begin, I'm going to read from God's Word from Psalm chapter 66, and then we'll have some songs, sing some, some hymns together. So Psalm chapter 66. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Give to Him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds toward the children of man. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. There did we rejoice in him, who rules by his might forever, whose eyes keep watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard, who has kept our soul among the living and has not let our feet slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. He went through fire. We went through fire and through water. Yet you have brought us out to a place of abundance. I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will perform my vows to you, that which my lips uttered. And my mouth promised when I was in trouble. I will offer to you burnt offerings of fattened animals with the smoke of the sacrifice of rams. I will make an offering of bulls and goats. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. Let's pray. Amen. God, we thank you that you have not removed your steadfast love from us. And Lord, though we go through many trials, we know that you have sent those trials to us for our good and for your glory. We pray that we would not waste the difficulties that you send our way, that we would use these uh, these times to grow closer to you and become more like your son. Lord, we pray now, Lord, as we sing praises to your name, that it would be pleasing to you. Lord, that even though we cannot gather together, we know that we are united in spirit. We are united through our, our love for Christ. Lord, we, we pray your blessing upon all who are listening, that you would save those who need to be saved, Lord, and that you would sanctify your saints. So we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first hymn this morning will be, He Leadeth Me. So we have the words up on the screen. We hope that you can see them clearly enough so that you can sing along at home with us. So the first song is, He Leadeth Me. He leadeth me, O blessed thought. O oh, words with heavenly comfort from whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me, his faithful follower I would be. For by his hand he leadeth me. Lord, I would clasp thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur, nor repine. Content, whatever lot I see, since tis thy hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me by his own hand he leadeth me his faithful follower i would be for by his hand he leadeth me and when the
song will be I Surrender All. All to Jesus I surrender All to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him In His presence daily Just by way of announcements, um, not too much has changed, obviously. So um, as far as offerings go, we are accepting donations through sassgospelchurch.com or uh, checks mailed in, obviously, um, or um, well, uh, also uh, Thursday night, we're going to have Bible study. Once again, through Facebook Live, going back into uh, Leviticus. Uh, so please uh, join us for that. That's Thursday night at 7 p.m. And I think that's it as far as announcements go. And so um, we're going to go ahead and, and pray once more that God would 
help us and teach us through his word this morning. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word that you promised will never pass away. Though heaven and earth may pass away, your word will never pass away. And we thank you for the security and the surety that is your word that never goes away. So, Father, we ask you to help us today. We need your help. Lord, you promised to send the Holy Spirit to be our helper. And we thank you for sending him. We ask him to fill our hearts right now. Lord, for those who don't know you, who are not saved, God, I pray that you would do a work of grace in their hearts, convict them by your Holy Spirit, draw them to yourself, O oh God. And Lord, sanctify your children. May we be encouraged in your word today by your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, uh, you can go ahead and grab one and pull one up on your computer and, and turn to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, I'll be reading from the ESV, the English Standard Version. Mark chapter 14, I've entitled this message, Investing in Christ. Investing in Christ. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 9 in a moment. You know, many financial experts will tell you that it is a good idea, it's a wise thing to invest your money at least part of your money into precious metals, such as gold and silver. Uh, so if you have money that you've invested in the hopes of getting a return, uh, many will tell you it's not a, a good idea to put everything you have into one place like the stock market. Right? They say you should diversify your portfolio. And the logic behind that is that the stock market, while it may give you a higher return than something like gold or silver, it is a volatile thing. Right? The money you invest in the stock market might be soaring one day and then the next day disappear because of something like what we're experiencing now, a, a global pandemic or some other thing. Uh, precious metals, on the other hand, tend to be much more stable. They yield less of a return, but if you invest in them, it's a pretty safe bet. You're really not going to lose much money if something went wrong. And since the beginning of time, pretty much, Humans have been using gold as the standard of value. Even in Genesis chapter 2, all the way back then, the Garden of Eden is described as being around a place where there was much gold. And here we are thousands of years later, and we still consider gold to be valuable. All the cash that you have, the dollar bills you have, or lack thereof, they're supposed to represent gold, right? And of course, the government keeps printing more money, uh, but not increasing the amount of gold, and then we get inflation. But at the end of the day, gold is still considered to be the standard of value in the world's economy even today. And given what's going on in the world right now and seeing how volatile the market is currently, perhaps you could see some wisdom in investing in something like gold because you see that as investing in a sure thing. And you may think about how to invest your money here in the best way, in order to get the best return and to be a good steward of your finances. But do you ever think about eternal investments? You might do financial planning, but do you do spiritual planning? Do you think about investing into the eternal our text this morning has some important truths that should cause us to think and then act upon investing our lives into something and someone of eternal value. And that, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom. So let's read Mark chapter 14, verses 1 through 9. It says, It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. 
There were some who said to themselves indignantly, Why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done, nothing, she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you could do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. So last time... We were in Mark. We're working our way through the book of Mark. If you're joining us for the first time, it's been a while. So we're up to chapter 14. And the last part that we looked at was what's called the Olivet Discourse. And so now we're a couple days past that in, in the timeline here. A couple days have passed since Jesus spoke of this prophecy in Mark chapter 13 uh, of the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And Jesus is going to die very soon. And today, in, in the events here, in the series of events, today is Thursday. Uh, tonight, he's, he's going to be betrayed and arrested. And the next day, he's going to be crucified. And Jesus knows this is going to happen. He knows they're conspiring against him and that they're going to arrest him soon. He knows any day now, he's going to die a brutal death and bear the sins of his people, and the wrath of the Father. But he's not cowering in fear. He's not depressed. He continues doing the will of God, his Father, until the appointed time has come for him to die. And this all takes place providentially during Passover. And Passover, as you may know, was a time when the Jewish people would remember when God delivered them out of slavery, out of the, out of the slavery of Egypt specifically when God commanded the Israelites that they were to, to sacrifice a lamb and put its blood over their doorposts. And whoever did that, whoever would put the blood over the doorpost, would have the angel of death pass over their house. And so the blood of the lamb protected them from the wrath of God. And so you see the symbolism here. This was the final plague against the Egyptians, and the means by which God would use to break Pharaoh to the point where he was then willing to finally let them go. Passover uh, was one of those few holy days, those holidays, those festivals where the Jews would come from all over parts of the world uh, and go back to Jerusalem to celebrate this every year. So the chief priests, the scribes, the religious rulers who hated Jesus and have been wanting to get rid of Jesus for quite some time now, they're trying to figure out a way to arrest him and kill him. But they don't want to do it just quite yet. And the reason is because they're going to have a huge amount of people, thousands of people coming to Jerusalem for Passover week, and many of them love Jesus. Think of all the thousands of people who were healed by him and were enamored with his teaching and saw him perform many miracles and were even recipients of those miracles themselves or their loved ones were healed or had demons cast out of them. So the last thing the scribes and Pharisees wanted was for their plan to be thwarted by the crowds of people who were fond of Jesus. So they figured, let's not do this during Passover, right? So let's wait a little bit. But that didn't happen. In God's province, Jesus was killed. Jesus was crucified during Passover. He became that Passover lamb. As Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Jesus is our Passover lamb. So the evil religious rulers didn't want this to happen during that time, but God did. God is in control of all events, even the, the, the wicked plans of men. So what happened was, even though they wanted to wait until after Passover, they couldn't turn down Judas's offer, as we'll get to later on when we get further into chapter 14 in the coming weeks. The opportunity came for them to get Jesus. And for them, it wasn't the best timing, but they figured they might as well take advantage of this and, and, and arrest him now 
We got the opportunity to do this, and so they did, even though it was not the ideal time for them. And thus Jesus became that perfect and final Passover lamb. Not only that, there were tremendous amounts of people in town to witness as a declaration to them that Jesus was that final sacrifice once and for all. So God used the wicked plans of men to accomplish the greatest thing to ever happen in all of history. The enemies of Christ had him murdered, but God used that to redeem sinners. So what the enemy meant for evil, and in fact, the greatest evil, God meant it for good. And while this plot to kill the Messiah is unfolding, Jesus is going about his business. As I said, he's not hiding in fear, trembling. What are they going to do to me? He was going about his father's business. In verse 3, it says, And while he was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. So Jesus was in the house of a leper. Not only that, John chapter 12, which is where uh, his account of this story takes place, John 12 tells us that Lazarus was there too. So Jesus is in the house with a leper who's ritually unclean, and a guy he raised from the dead is there as well, Lazarus. So this is a, a great snapshot of who Jesus was. Right? He's hanging out with a leper and a guy that he rose from the dead. Jesus was and is the only one who can undo the effects of the curse of sin upon humanity. The lepers, as we studied in Leviticus a couple weeks ago in, in chapter 13, the lepers were to live in isolation until they were cured, if at all. And lepros leprosy could be a vari uh, various uh, different kinds of, of skin diseases, not just leprosy itself. Uh, so they, if you had a leprous skin disease, you were to be isolated until you were cured, if that was possible. And here's Jesus. Jesus was the cure for the sickness. And even for death itself, as he proved when he raised Lazarus from the dead. He was, and he was going to prove it again in a few days when he rose himself from the dead. And in the mix of this comes this woman. John tells us her name is Mary, most likely Mary Magdalene. And she has this alabaster flask of ointment made of nard. And this came from the spike nard plant, which is native to the Himalayan mountains in Tibet and India and China. So you can imagine how costly it must have been considering someone had to bring this oil, this ointment, all the way from the Himalayan mountains to Jerusalem. That's quite a trek. They would no doubt go along the, the silk roads to get through Asia into Jerusalem. Uh, so naturally, this is going to be a very costly, very rare perfume. And she takes the whole thing and pours the whole thing on his head. And being this is such an expensive item, an expensive perfume, typically you would not use it all in one shot. You would probably just use a little bit at a time, uh, maybe for special occasions. Um, and, and while it was a rare oil, a rare ointment, it, was, it wasn't unknown in the Near East. In fact, nard was sometimes used as an incense, even in Jewish temple worship. And the ancient Egyptians would use this in embalming, the, in the embalming process for mummies. And one thing I never realized before about this story is that this woman, Mary, you know, she poured the whole flask of ointment on Jesus' head just a day before he died. If you look at the timeline of this, uh, when you're reading through the chapter, it seems like this is all a long period of time because it's a lot of text when you're reading 13, 14, 15, but just a couple days. So she, she poured this on his head just a day before he was crucified. And this is a very potent, very aromatic oil that no doubt kept its strong scent as it clung to Jesus' hair even the next day while he's being crucified. 
And this kind of puts it to perspective a little bit how in Leviticus we read that God delighted in the aroma of the sacrifices that were burned, the burnt offerings. And on a personal level, for Jesus himself, as Jesus was languishing there on the cross, and the bitterness uh, and the bitter taste of the sweat and the blood dripping from his pierced brow mixed in with the sweetness of the oil that inevitably, inevitably flowed into his mouth, he would be reminded then that though this is a bitter cup to drink, it's not entirely bitter. What he was doing would save those like Mary who anointed him with this costly perfume. Mary put the entire flask of perfume on his head, not just a couple drips on his wrist or, or his neck to smell a little good for a couple hours. He, she put the whole thing on his hair. Some people didn't like that she did that. Look at verses 4 and 5. It says, There were some who said to themselves indignantly, Why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold from more than 300 denarii, and given to the poor, and they scolded her. And John tells us there in chapter 12 again of his gospel that it was Judas who said this. So Judas was the, the, the main one who was upset at this, and probably some of the other disciples agreed. That's why it says, uh, you know, um, some who said to themselves indignantly, they, they probably like, yeah, he's right. Why, why did she waste this? They agreed. And how, how could she dump out? That entire thing like that. They scolded her because they said they thought she wasted it all. That's something you just do a little bit here and there, and, and it's very expensive. This was valued at 300 denarii. So at one denarius was a day's wage for a laborer back then. So that's 300 days worth of labor, the value of that. If you estimate in our day, if this happened today, we, it would probably be like $30,000 or something like that, maybe a little more. So imagine if this happened today, and you were there to witness this woman pour thirty grand worth of ointment on Jesus' head. What would you say? You might have said the same thing as Judas. That's a waste of money. You could have given that to the poor. You could have invested that and got a return on it. So we see here how, how Satan was using Judas and the others who agreed with him to try to make her feel guilty about what she had done. And this is why Satan is referred to as the accuser of the brethren. This was a friend of Jesus, and the devil was saying that she's acting foolishly, basically through the mouth of Judas and the others. But you know the real reason why Judas was upset that she gave this ointment to Jesus instead of selling it. John 12, 6 says, He said this, Judas said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So if this woman had sold the nard to give to the poor, Judas would have been in charge of that money bag and he would have had a nice chunk of change to dip into, and now it's gone. The Judas loved money. He loved money so much that he would very soon betray Jesus for just 30 pieces of silver. And perhaps this was the final thing, the final motivating factor for him to betray Jesus. Right? He wanted money out of this. This is what he was doing all along. He wanted money. He couldn't get it from selling the nard, so he'd get it from selling Jesus, or selling Jesus out. So we see here through Judas's scolding of Mary how Satan is the accuser, and then we see how Jesus is the advocate. Look at verse 6. He says, But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Jesus defends his children. He is their legal advocate. He stands up to the devil the accuser of the brethren in their defense. 1 John 2, 1. And my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So on the day of judgment, you need an advocate. You need someone to stand in your place 
and plead your case of innocence before God. And you're not made innocent through your good works. You are made innocent and righteous through faith in Jesus Christ alone. His righteousness is imputed to you. It's given to you if you turn from your sin and trust in him and your sin is put upon him. There is a divine exchange and, and Jesus will declare you righteous before God. Mary here in our text demonstrated tremendous faith in her anointing Jesus with this costly perfume. And those who trust in Christ are defended by Christ. They rebuke her for her faith, but Jesus rebukes them. It's better to be rebuked by men and defended by Jesus than the other way around. He says, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. She's done something even better than helping the poor. She was glorifying Jesus himself, preparing him for his death on her behalf. This was an outpouring of love and gratitude for Christ and a demonstration of her faith in him as her savior who was to die in her place. And Jesus said that was a beautiful thing that she did. Let's look at verses 7 and 8. It says, For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you could do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. So Jesus is kind of bringing out the big picture here. This was a very unique time. Jesus will soon die. Though this reality of the reality of that has not really set in yet for them, the disciples have been so reluctant to believe that he was going to die. So to them, if, if this woman, Mary, was going to get rid of the perfume, she should have sold it and given it to the poor. Right? Although we know Judas certainly had ulterior motives there. But Jesus tells them, you'll have plenty of time to help the poor. They're always going to be there. But he's telling them he's not going to be around much longer. Yes, he's going to come back from the dead. But then sometime later, he's going to ascend into heaven and he's not going to be there with them anymore. So to use this perfume to help prepare Jesus for his death, which had eternal ramifications, was far more appropriate than it was to sell it and give it to the poor. When in fact, most of it would have probably ended up in Judas's pockets anyway. He says she's done what she could. She's done what she could. And keep in mind, this alabaster flask was probably the most valuable thing this woman owned. And she gave it all away to God. This could have been her inheritance. This could have been used to, to give her something to fall back on in case there was any financial hardship in the future. Had she become a widow and destitute, this would have been a tremendous financial help for her. But she gave it to Jesus. She gave up all her future financial stability for the sake of gaining Christ. Like the Apostle Paul, she counted the value of that perfume as dung for the sake of gaining Christ. She saw Christ, trusted in him, and said, I desire him more than this perfume. He is worthy of my everything, including my financial future, so I will bless him and anoint him with this oil. She saw Christ as being that pearl of great price and did what she could to get him. And it was not that she literally bought his favor with this ointment. Her giving this ointment to him was just proof of her faith in him. And she did what she could. Very similar to the widow with the two mites. We looked at that story some time ago. The widow, too, did what she could with what she had, right? Mary here had something far more valuable than two pennies. She had a year's worth of wages, basically, and she said, I'm going to give this to Jesus. The widow gave a little, Mary gave a lot, both of whom did what they could out of faith. And Mary pouring this oil on Jesus was not just like a monetary donation. This is not the same thing as just cutting a check to him. Jesus said, she anointed my body beforehand for burial. As I mentioned before, this 
aroma was likely still there the next day when Jesus was crucified. This was an act of faith. This work that she had done was rooted in faith. It was the product of faith. She was trusting that Jesus was going to die for her, and she did what she could to prepare him for his burial. She took what was likely her most valuable possession and invested it in Jesus and his kingdom. So what did her investment yield? What did she get back? Verse 9, Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the, whole, in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. So this woman sacrificed probably her most valuable item for the sake of Christ and the repercussions, the yield from this investment was of eternal value. She forsook the temporal in exchange for the eternal. And what Jesus said here was a prophecy that quite obviously has, has been and is continuing to be fulfilled even today. We're reading about this now 2,000 years later. This story is recorded in three out of the four Gospels. And since this happened, since this was written, and since it happened, probably billions of people throughout history all over the world have read about or heard about how this woman gave everything she had in worship to Christ. And who knows how many say, uh, souls have been saved by reading this passage of Scripture about what this woman has done. And even now, we're through social media, the Internet, this is easily going, can go all over the world. So wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, it's going to be told in memory of her. The sacrifice she made for Christ in faith was paid back with an eternal amount of interest. Giving everything you are, giving your life to Jesus Christ results in returns that transcend time and geography and everything else. He said that wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. This was a greater investment than just giving it away to the poor, which would have been a good thing, but this was even better. I think this story also serves to show the contrast here between the enemies of Christ and the friends of Christ. And the enemies of Christ of the story are the religious rulers who wanted him killed, and Judas Iscariot, who would go on uh, to betray him for some money. Let's just compare Judas. Look, just compare Judas to the woman, right? Who, whose legacy is better? Judas betrayed Jesus, and he felt guilty about it, returned the money, threw the money on the floor, and hung himself and was disemboweled. That's the end of Jesus. Uh, Judas, sorry. That was the end of Judas. The only legacy he left today really is we use his name to describe people who stab you in the back right i thought that person was my friend but it turned out they're just a judas his name today is synonymous for people who betray you no one names their kid judas these days i've, I've never heard of one it's a nice name it's too bad it's been tarnished nobody names their children after this man it's, a, it's just a negative word. That's what happened to the enemy of Christ in this story. But the friend of Christ, Mary, who was scolded by Christ's enemy, her story was recorded in Scripture, and it tells of the great faith and love that she had for the Savior and her anointing him for burial, and how she valued him more than all her earthly possessions. And as, as the gospel has been going around the whole world for the last 2,000 years, so has the story of what she has done in sacrificing this, that costly perfume. And if we could ask her today, Mary, was it worth sacrificing that perfu perfume for Jesus? She would no doubt say, of course it was. It's nothing, really. If we could ask Judas today, Judas, was it worth betraying Jesus for those 30 pieces of silver? He would definitely say, absolutely not. In fact, before he killed himself, we know he decided it wasn't worth it because he gave back the money. 
With that, I'd like to close with just a, a few points of application. First, when you, when you look at the first section, the first two verses of this passage, and you see how God orchestrated the crucifixion to happen during Passover. Even though these men had other plans, they had their evil plans to take place, so this could be done in, kind of in secret just to get rid of Jesus. God did otherwise. God or, somehow orchestrated things to happen so that Jesus was crucified during Passover and thus became the Passover lamb. In fact, he was killed. He died around 3 o'clock, which is the very time in which they began to slaughter lambs for Passover. And I think it's important for us to think about those things, those deep things that we don't even really understand how God could do such a thing like that. But it's encouraging because... Sometimes you might tend to worry about future events, right? How is this, how is this all going to work out? I don't even know what I'm doing next, uh, especially now given the whole world is shut down. What's going to happen after this? How am I going to pay my bills, pay my rent? How is this going to happen? How is that going to happen? How is this going to work out? We worry about future things, how they will work out. But God is in control of all future events, and he will work out everything for his children for their good. Just like he orchestrated this horrible event, the crucifixion, ultimately for good, in fact, for the best thing that ever happened. It became the best thing that ever happened. God is in control of all future things, and he will work everything out according to his purpose. And it will all work out for your benefit if you are one of his children. Secondly, make sure that you really are a friend of Jesus and not an enemy of Jesus. Now, you might think that you're a friend of Jesus, and you might say, well, I love Jesus, but Judas would have said the same thing sometime before he betrayed him, that he's following Jesus. Are you a friend of Christ? like Mary was in the story? Or are you like Jesus? Perhaps you've even followed Jesus like, like Judas, but you're only following him for ulterior motives, for maybe selfish gain. It might not be for money, but maybe you claim to be a Christian, like Judas did, but you're only in it for yourself. Maybe you think being religious and doing the, this, this Christian thing maybe you were raised in or something, that, that's the right thing to do. It makes you overall a better person or something. But the truth is, you need to be a friend of Jesus Christ. You need to have an intimate relationship with him. You're either his friend or his enemy. You don't become his friend by adhering to a set of religious rules. You become his friend by giving him your entire life, by denying yourself forsaking everything, forsaking all sin and everything you have in order to gain Christ. Have you done that? Are you his friend or are you his enemy? Consider the end of his enemies and turn from your sin today and trust in the crucified and risen Savior so that you too can be his friend. Third point. Of application. Just as Jesus said to this woman, about this woman rather, that she, she did what she could, you too must do what you can. And what I mean by that is that if you're a Christian, use every resource you have, every gift that God has given you, use every minute that he's given you here on earth to serve him in everything that you do. This woman was given a valuable resource. There were many different ways in which she could have used this resource that she had. She could have kept it for herself and just used it for perfume, probably for a long time. She could have saved it as an emergency uh, fund, really a financial backup. She could have saved it to give to her children as an inheritance. She could have sold it and bought property with it. She could have even sold it sold it and give the money to the poor, right? And, and none of those things are bad in and of themselves. But in that moment, the best thing she could do 
with that resource was to give it directly to Jesus. That was the best use of the resource she had. She got the greatest return from anointing Jesus with it. And so we must ask God for wisdom so that we might use the resources and time that he's given us for his glory. We need to consider the eternal value of things. We need to consider the eternal consequences of the decisions we make. We need to have eternity stamped upon our eyes, as Jonathan Edwards used to say. Ask God to do that to you so that you can glorify him and advance his kingdom with the gifts that God has given you. And lastly, keep your eyes focused on the end return that your investment in Christ will yield. A life of sacrifice for Christ and his kingdom will have eternal rewards and eternal reper repercussions. It's not a wasted life to live a life of sacrifice to Jesus and his kingdom. In other words, anything you sacrifice here for the sake of Christ is absolutely worth it. Mary certainly had no regrets in giving that costly ointment to Jesus for him to use. And even though at times here in this life, following Christ might cost you much, and giving of your time and your energy and your resources for the sake of the kingdom may not seem to give you any return here, you must believe that God is glorified through your sacrifice and will use it for his purposes. Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what is a profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would give us eyes to see, to see the beauty and the glory of Christ, that your Son is far more valuable than anything this world has to offer. And Lord, may we live lives of sacrificial obedience to him and his kingdom and his will. Lord, stamp eternity on our eyes that we might live for Jesus, that we really would surrender all to Jesus. Jesus paid it all, all to him we owe. Help us by your grace to see that and believe that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.